Welcome to Soaring the Sky, a Glider Pilots podcast. Hello, my name is Chuck. I will be your host. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Soaring Incorporated, the nation's largest provider of professional glider training. Since 1969, they provided training from initial private through CFI Glider and entry level through advanced aerobatics. Open year-round, seven days a week. More information is available at azsoaring.com. Joining us today is Paul Schweitzer. He was born into aviation. From his earliest days, Schweitzer aircraft and aviation were important parts of his life. At age 14, he became a sailplane pilot. By the age of 18, he was an experienced sailplane contest pilot and flight instructor. After graduation from Dartmouth College with an engineering degree, Paul joined the Boeing Company, where he did the preliminary design engineering on the Compass Cope unmanned vehicle. His Boeing experience with surveillance aircraft and unmanned vehicles influenced Schweitzer's future. In 1977, Paul and his family left Seattle and joined Schweitzer Aircraft. His focuses were the marketing and financial areas of the company. He was intimately involved with the new business aspects of the company, including the purchase of the helicopter program, Schweitzer's line of surveillance aircraft, and the Fire Scout unmanned helicopter. Paul retired in 2009, five years after Sikorsky purchased the company. He continues to be an active pilot and retains his passion for aviation. Join us now as we sit down with Paul Schweitzer and hear his journey on Soaring the Sky. Paul Schweitzer, welcome to the podcast today. I'm really happy you've joined me. I'm excited to hear your story. Where did your big aviation adventure begin? <laughs> well, unlike most people, I was bo- born into it. I, From my earliest days, I was involved with the glider b- operations at Harris Hill and, and at Elmira and the Schweitzer factory. So the... Uh, it began 73 years ago, I guess you could say. What was that like being around all that aviation just from the beginning? You know, it's interesting because after all these years, I still love to fly sailplanes. I have a tremendous interest in aviation of all flavors. And, uh, you know, I felt like I was the most fortunate kid in the world because I loved airplanes and uh, I, I grew up with them. So take me back to the story of your father and his brother. Okay, yeah. I wrote the book Flying with the Schweitzers because I wanted to preserve the history of the company. And uh, if I I realized that if I didn't do it, nobody else would do it. So I've spent the last three or three and a half years working on this story and putting it together. And one of the reasons I wrote it, because it truly is a wonderful story. It's it's the story of the American dream. My father and his brother were born to two Swiss immigrants who came to the U.S. And about my, I think my grandfather came in 2007 and his wife came a couple of years later. And my my grandfather was a chef. He he owned the restaurant at Carnegie Hall for many years. So my father and his brother. My father was born in 1917. His two brothers, Paul and Ernie, were, you know, I think four and six years older than he. But they were lived at the time of the golden age of aviation. With the, And Lindbergh became their hero when he flew across the ocean. And in 1929, they read an article in the National Geographic magazine about Germans flying at the Wasserkuppe. And then some Germans who came to the U.S. and flew in Cape Cod. And they immediately saw this was how they needed to realize their dream of aviation. So they designed a glider. And then they they weren't a wealthy family. So they had to save every penny they could get to build materials. And they built their glider. And in June of 1930, they made their first flight. I find it rather interesting that when they made their first flight, they didn't know anybody who was a pilot, and they had never been in an aircraft, so they had to teach themselves how to fly. And they would they used a shock cord for a launch, launch themselves a few feet in the air and figure out how ailerons and elevators work and rudders, I suppose. 
and then they would gradually launch themselves higher and higher. And they had lots of crashes, no serious injuries. And so they then went on the next year to design and build a second glider. And really from that most humble of beginnings, they, the company went on and they formed the company in 1939 and the company produced 6,200 aircraft over the years. And so that's kind of a wonderful story to tell. And I, it was a pleasure for me to write about it. Not knowing how to fly, just teaching themselves that in itself is amazing to me. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> I don't know how many guys would have the guts to do it, but they, I mean, they were just totally whipped up by aviation. And it's interesting. My, In particular, my uncle Paul, who was the middle brother, he never lost that. And I mean, soaring in sailplanes were his life. My Uncle Ernie was the designer, and he designed all the Schweitzer sailplanes up until the his son Les designed the 135. And then my father ran the factory, and he, you know, and he was more the business person. But soaring in sailplanes w- were their lives. Now they built other things besides sailplanes, correct? Mm-hmm. During World War II, they were producing gliders for the war effort, and about Sometime in 1943, the Army Air Corps decided they had enough gliders, and so they arranged for Schweitzer to start building components for Fairchild, Republic, and Chase. So that that's how they got into the subcontract business. When did they get into helicopters? Well, they didn't. Uh, <laughs> the what happened is, you know, like every struggling business or aviation business after World War II, the company just was, you know, sort of hand to mouth. They didn't have enough work. And so they did almost anything they could just to keep the doors open. But they were fortunate because they established a good relationship with Grumman, Grumman Aircraft during the war and after the war. And so in 1956, Grumman had designed a agricultural spray airplane, a biplane, and they came to Schweitzer and asked if Schweitzer could build it for them because a commercial product like that was it just it was not a good fit for a military producer like Grumman. And so the the AgCat was really how they got started in the airplane business. And uh, I don't know, remember the numbers, but they went on and produced more than 2,000 aircraft. And it was really the staple of the company for the up until the late 1970s. And the way my book is structured, um, my father wrote a book called Soaring with the Schweitzers in 1990. And he talked about his the early years and he did a sort of a chronological year-by-year report on what happened to the company. I took my father's book and basically edited about 50% of it out to try to keep it tighter and maybe more meaningful to people for today. And so my father's edited book is the part one of my book. And then in 1980, we transitioned the business from my father and his two brothers to my cousin Les, who is Ernie's son, and then my brother Stu and I. My uncle Paul had did not have any children. So when we took over the business, it was at a real low point. The ag business was terrible and really falling off a cliff. The company had some subcontract work. There was not a lot of subcontract activity in aerospace in the late 70s because of a recession. And so we struggled, the three of us struggled for a couple of years. And then we learned that Hughes Helicopters in uh, California wanted to sell the 269 series helicopter. That was the first helicopter that they produced. And uh, Hughes had recently won the Apache program. And they just didn't have any capability to produce Apaches and build light helicopters. So 
we looked at the program and competed with four or five other firms for the business. And we were very fortunate to be selected by, by Hughes Helicopter. And the helicopter program became really the, the key portion of our business starting in 1983. Did you do any flying in the helicopter? Yeah, I, I, well, you know, build, being a helicopter company, I had a retired Army Master Sergeant who had taught thousands of people to fly in World War II, and his name was Bill Staba. And Bill used to come to the factory to do some demonstration flying and test flying for us. And Bill called me up one day and said, Paul, you own a helicopter company. I, you, I'm going to come up there this weekend and teach you how to fly them. And obviously, I'd flown in our products in, uh, you know, in the co-pilot capacity, but I had never soloed. And so, in two days of flying, very intense flying, I became a helicopter pilot, and it was great fun. Wow, a, quite a big difference from flying sailplanes, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love flying hel. I, I love flying everything. I, and I had owned my own airplane for years and years, and would use it for work, for transportation. And I still love to fly after all these times. But helicopters are really cool. The uh, Model 300C, which was our piston helicopter, was a terrific po- product between Hughes and Schweitzer. I think we produced close to 4,000 of them. And uh, it was, in my mind, the finest piston-powered helicopter ever produced. A little bias there, maybe. (laughs) Right. Can you tell me a little bit about that helicopter? It was basically uh, a two-passenger helicopter that if you configured it with only a a left-seat pilot, then you had... um, you could put a third person in it, but it was used by the U.S. Army as its basic training helicopter from early 1960s up until 1985. Hughes built, oh, I think, just about 800 of them for the U.S. Army. And But when we took over the program, our markets were foreign military training, police groups around the U.S., just all sorts of, you know, helicopters are so versatile, and ours was used for just about everything from picking up reindeer to uh, uh, shaking nuts off of trees, uh, <laughs> lifting Christmas trees out of the woods. It was a great helicopter, and we took the helicopter program, developed a new version, a new piston powered aircraft to make us more competitive in the commercial training market. And then we developed a turbine-powered version of it, initially called the Model 330, and over time it became the Model 333, and it was a terrific product for military training, and we finally broke into that market after we sold the business to Sikorsky. I believe it's one of the, because of the way we configured the cockpit and the performance of the aircraft, it was one of the finest training aircraft ever built. So if we could go back a little bit, what was your first flight and what what got you into flying? Who did you learn from? Well, I learned at the Schweitzer Soaring School. I started flying in 1959 with Bernie Karras, who a lot of the soaring world knows. He was a chief instructor at the soaring, uh, Schweitzer Soaring School for years and years, and a terrific person. And so I soloed when I was 14, became, you know, got my private. And then in 19, when I was 18, I became a flight instructor. So I spent my summers working at the glider school. And then after I was 18, I spent them teaching at the glider, teaching flying. Were you flying primarily the 233 when you were teaching? What were you flying? Yeah, at that time, the 233 was really the only trainer in the U.S. Of course, we had 232s there for for rides. That's a terrific product. And uh, then, you know, I would I competed at several national contact contests during that period. But I I was almost like my father. I just couldn't get enough. But I love flying more than anything. 
I can totally relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, you think it would wear away, but I still own a 135, and I still love to fly. How is the 135? The 135 is a terrific product. The, the, it is a bit challenging for some because it does not have die brakes. It just has flaps. And they take some getting used to. But it's, you know, it's the one I have. It's close to a 40 to 1 sailplane. And because it's metal, it will basically will last forever. It will last until somebody creams it. And I'm hoping that's not me. So uh, it's, I really love the sailplane. But, but I have enough, you know, I've been flying it forever. And I, I really... Um, I'm very comfortable in it. What were you flying mostly in the contest that you flew? Was there a certain aircraft you flew a lot of? or I flew in a couple of 126 national contests. I flew a 123 way back in the late 60s in a contest in Elmira. And then I flew a 134 in a national contest in the freight of Washington during the mid-1970s. I don't remember the, the year, but... You know, unfortunately, the Schweitzer products, when it came to competition, uh, a number of several attempts were made to develop a competitive sailplane in the 60s and 70s. And things like the 134 were a good sailplane, but it just didn't have the performance of this, the fiberglass sailplane. The 135 was designed to the standard class and then the requirement chain. But Schweitzer, we made the decision, and I was very much part of this, that you know that just is not our future, building high-performance sailplanes. We continued to build training sailplanes, and we built 126s and replaced the 126 with the 136 to give people better performance. But it, it's, you know, the, the, the sailplanes were uh, an act of love for the company and the owners, and the real business for us was building help building sailplane or I mean um, helicopters and then we got involved with covert surveillance aircraft and then we, we became the leader in the world in unmanned helicopters and so in my portion of the book I talk about that transition in the period from 1980 up through when Sikorsky bought the company in 2004. You flew some contests with the 126. How, how was that? I, I love flying the 126 myself. It's so far my favorite, but of course I haven't flown that many yeah. gliders yet, but it's definitely a favorite. The 126 is so forgiving. It's and it's got you know wonderful handling property. And 126 contest. It's, it's interesting. The first 126 contest was in, I believe, 1956. If it wasn't 56, it was 57. And they're still holding national 126 contests well, almost 60 years later, or 60 years later. So, I mean, that that kind of speaks for itself. They're just It's really fun to fly in in a 126 contest, and they sort of have a feel which is quite different than other national contests where it's really serious. People fly in the con- the 126 kind of because they're fun, and uh, it's nice when everybody's flying the same same type aircraft. I know you can't do any aerobatics in the 126 now, from what I understand, but I understand they used to actually do some aerobatics in it. Yeah, air, the, that's a certification and a liability issue. You know, Schweitzer just didn't. It's not that the aircraft weren't strong enough. Uh, Brett Willett used to do a routine in the 232 that was phenomenal. But the company basically did not want people using for aerobatics because we didn't want to see people injured in them or have aircraft pulled apart. So that is why they're, they're not certified for, for aerobatics. What was one of your most memorable flights? I know you've had a lot of flights, but if you could pick one or two, what would you? <laughs> oh, guys. Uh, well, I think one of, one of them, clearly when I was a kid, I wanted to fly in a contest in, I think, 1968 in the national contest. 
and uh, but I didn't have my gold C, which was required, and so I needed to make a 200 mile flight, and I was so I took off in a 123, and the, given the way the winds were and the weather appeared, I was I picked a destination of, of Bennington, Vermont, which was probably about 70 degrees from Elmira. And um, shortly after takeoff, the clouds were far better to the south, so I deviated. I didn't have a a uh, map. The uh, map I had was really a New York State sectional, and it covered the no- north of where I was. And so I basically flew for five and a half hours, not knowing where I was, but thinking I was heading to the east. And uh, I was over mountain, mountainous ter- or rugged mountainous terrain the whole time. And finally, it got to be about oh five o'clock at night. And I looked down and I saw an airport. And lo and behold, there was a monument there. And so I I was tired, figured, what the heck, maybe this was Bennington, because I had seen the monument, the Revolutionary War monument at Bennington before. So I dropped down a little bit and tried to read the name of the monument as I circled around it and couldn't do it. And I said, what the heck? And so I landed in a at an air at the little airport that I saw. I thought rather than go and ask the people in the the uh, administration building where I was, I thought it'd be best to just look at a car and see what the license plates were. And turned out I was in New Jersey and I had landed at the struggling for the name of the town I landed in. But I had been flying all day to the southeast and flew over the Pocono Mountains. And uh, so I was about probably 70 or 80 degrees off course. And that was a oh. flight. <laughs> but uh, not maybe my proudest achievement as an aviator, but it was a, it was quite an experience. Were you riding thermals then most of the day or ridge all, lift? What were you getting? I don't know. It was all thermal activity. So can you tell me how we could get a hold of your book that you've written? It sounds very interesting. and I know a lot of people are going to want to check that out. Yeah. There are a few different sources. Most of the major booksellers carry the book. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, other online booksellers. And it's also, uh, there's a website by the publisher. So if you Google flyingwiththeschweitzers.com, the iUniverse website will show up. And the, there are no spaces between the flying and with or the, or the Schweitzers. And then there's one other uh, source where if you and, – and basically there's a link to it from the iUniverse site. And this is called flyingwiththeschweitzers.bigcartel, B-I-G-C-A-R-T-E-L dot com. And on that website, it's my personal website – and if people want to have copies of the book signed by me, they can buy them from that website. So there are a lot of different options. Up to this point, I'm just beginning the marketing of the book. It's Nobody really knows it's been written. It's just come out in the last week or so on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Uh, SS, Soaring Society of America will be selling it. The Soaring Museum will be sign, selling it. Uh, I'm talking to Wings and Wheels. So it, it will be going on a num- number of the soaring-related places. And I probably will be expanding that to aviation museums because the book, it's certainly the story of Schweitzer aircraft, but it, it has interesting aviation history in it. Because Schweitzer has been involved with so many things over the years related to aviation. And it's interesting to me that there are some people who know us because of our covert surveillance aircraft. Others because of our AGCAT airplane, the the spray airplane. Others because of our helicopter activity. And then certainly still others because of our soaring activities. So my book covers 
all of those product areas. And uh, I hope I hope people will enjoy it. Well, I'm really happy that you started this journey and happy that you're going to be sharing the story. It's, it is quite an amazing story. And I'm I'm very happy that you shared this with us today. If I could ask you through all the years of flying you've done, if you could give some advice to pilots to be smarter pilots and safer pilots, what would you tell them? You know, I think most in being in the aviation business, I was always very, very conscious of liabilities. I mean, the, the reality of the U.S. society is if somebody crashes an aircraft, invariably they want to sue the manufacturer because certainly the pilot didn't do anything wrong. The reality is most accidents, and even more so with soaring accidents, it's pilot error. One of the things that Schweitzer Aircraft really f- was critical to our thought process as we designed and built aircraft was pilot safety. My father and his two brothers were at Harris Hill during the early 1930s and watched the person who crashed in a, in a sailplane where his wings came off. And from that experience, my uncle Ernie became renowned in aviation for building you know, his iron gliders, they're incredibly safe, incredibly strong. And it's something we personally, as as a family, took great pride in. And it was interesting, I think our the Schweitzer sailplanes are renowned for their safety of flight and protecting pilots. But when the, our, the AGCAT airplane that we made for Grumman was very much the same. Grumman designed an incredibly safe airplane. And we were very much focused on safety. When we then took over the helicopter program, the Hughes 300 helicopter was renowned to be the safest of any piston-powered helicopter. And we did things that made it even safer. So safety and integrity was fundamental to the Schweitzer's design concept on all of our products. And that's something that I think we can take great pride in. Uh, you certainly can hurt yourself, and but you can hurt yourself in anything. And the number of letters we received over the years for people thanking us that they were in a Schweitzer glider when they had an accident that saved their life is, I mean, you you can't put a value on it. It just is very special and uh, one of the things, my cousin Les and his son Kyle are running K&L Soaring, and they're supporting all the Schweitzer sailplanes. And, and it's really cool that they're there still dealing with the integrity and safety things and looking to make the products even safer. And I, When you think that the first 222 sailplane, which was the precursor to the 233 when that sailplane was built in the early 1950s and i have little doubt that in the year 2050 people will still be flying the 233s and 222s so having a sailplane that can last 100 years pretty much speaks for itself Absolutely. Amazing. Paul, thank you very much for joining us today. I I greatly appreciate you sharing your story. Well, Chuck, I do appreciate it. I'm I'm very pleased that you're doing what you're doing with a podcast, and I wish you all the best with it. I think I'm sure it will be a great addition to the Soaring Movement. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for another great guest here on Soaring the Sky. We would love to hear from you if you are a glider pilot and you have some stories you'd like to share. Love to have you here on the podcast. You can contact me at chuck at soaringthesky.com. If you are a listener and you want to say hello, love to hear from you. Let me know where you're listening from. Thank you for all the feedback you've been sending us from all over the globe. We greatly appreciate it and it encourages me to keep on doing this. If you are enjoying it and you haven't done so yet, subscribe so you won't miss any of the episodes. And if you want a sneak peek into some future episodes, you can always join us on Facebook or Instagram. That Soaring the Sky podcast will let you know what's coming up. We hope to see you back here next time for another great cast right here on Soaring the Sky.